Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah. Oops. Sorry. Let's see. To be too quick. Um, yes, I'm working at the World Maritime University. Those of you who are not familiar with the institution, we work under the auspices of the International Maritime Organization and serve the organization as its apex institution for postgraduate education and research in ocean and maritime affairs. I've been told or I've been asked to, to give a presentation about the maritime um, um, safety management uh, developments <coughs> in recent years. Please forgive my voice. It's not the result of excessive partying last night. It's rather the result of an ordinary cold. Um, so, but otherwise, I'm still capable of doing my presentation here. Um, in the short period of time that I have in order to introduce it, I can, of course, not go into all details, but I really would like to give some, some, of, the, um, some of the background information that was leading to, the, um, to a specific tool that the IMO developed in 1993, which is called the International Safety Management Code. And it is, um, it's, it's focusing on individual shipping companies. It is probably a little bit different from the aviation where on a country level, something is, is to, uh, to be achieved. It's, real, it's really up for individual companies in the member states, really, to set up safety management systems. So why was that needed? Let's start with that question. And here on this slide, basically, I've uh, given an early voice from, from the shipping industry uh, in 1994. The president of Det Norske Veritas was actually questioning in an article uh, he was not questioning it, actually, he was supporting the idea that uh, ship owners should uh, in invest more in safety. And he basically criticized at the time, apart from the safety culture, which he thought was very rare in the shipping business, there are two other types of cultures. The evasion culture, where basically substandard ships are operated and competitive advantages are achieved by operating these substandard ships. But he said most likely it is a compliance culture, and unless there are specific regulations that require safety management, there will probably not be a movement. This was 1994. Um, there were some, some early initiatives, um, basically, in the industry on a voluntary basis to establish safety management ideas in the shipping business. Here on this slide, I've basically listed a couple of those initiatives of earlier years. You can see that. In 1982 already, the International Chamber of Shipping basically uh, provided a code of good management practices and ship operations. This was followed by other uh, organizations. But in principle, um, I think if I read all the statistics correct, it was not uh, reaching more than 20% of the ship owners who volunteered at the time to set up similar systems like that. The idea basically in the 1980s was that uh, when, when you start um, uh, quality management systems according to ISO 9000, then the idea was basically that, I mean, if you want to achieve quality, then of course naturally this goes hand in hand with safety. So this is why um, the idea was there that on a voluntary basis that ship owners should basically have um, an idea of, of and also benefits in addressing safety through, a, uh, through an appropriate safety management system. The situation changed in the shipping sector in 1987 as a result of the capsize of the Herald of Free Enterprise. And the resulting investigation revealed that the shipping company has completely failed in addressing the safety needs uh, of, of the shipping company. In fact, the, um, the Justice Sheen, who was the, uh, who was the lead investigator, the REC commissioner in the UK, used relatively drastic words for the description of the condition in the company, as you can probably see here on this slide. Subsequently, in the IMO, discussions started in 1987 already, and with immediate, intermediate steps in, in 1993, the International Safety Management Code was adopted and um, basically exists since then um, with no substantial changes. It, had been, it, had been, it has been updated a couple of times, but the structure as it was in 1993 uh, is basically the same. You see here that's also a little bit similar to the aviation. Uh, the ISM code of the IMO consists of 16 elements. It's two parts, the implementation, and then part B, the certification and the verification. Part A is basically for any shipping company to take into consideration when they set up a safety management system. 
And it also starts here basically with a commitment of management to safety. So it's about setting up safety and environmental protection policies and also appointing somebody in the company as a designated person specifically being responsible for safety matters. What is also important to consider in this respect is the, master responsi the master's responsibility and authority. The master is given an overriding authority in the ISM code, so he can, in fact, do everything that is needed in order to maintain safety, and that's probably um, a, a very important task uh, that this clarification has been made. Part B specifically relates to the implementation and verification. This is a system now that's, um, that's subject to government authority verification. So this can either be done by the flag state authorities or many flag state authorities use service providers for this. The classification society is the most common used um, um, service provider in this respect. The question, of course, always is what has the ISM code achieved and uh, what has it changed? I think one thing is, is relatively clear, and that's basically that now uh, we have an, an international system with clearly defined minimum, stand, minimum conditions for um, these systems worldwide. It follows um, the ISO 9000 philosophy and it's basically set up in a similar way. Um, I think the challenge with this simply is that it describes the tasks, um, but not so much the way how to get there. Um, it is, if you wish, an invitation. It's like an empty shell that a shipping company has to fill with life in a situation-specific context. And that's maybe some of the issues where ship owners are struggling um, to a certain extent to fill that shell with, with uh, company-specific life. Um, but otherwise, of course, clearly it has resulted in a stronger focus also in the, in the shipping companies on safety. And um, as I said, the most important thing is probably that it's now subject to government verification and, and uh, um, yeah, uh, evaluation. There are, of course, I guess, like in many other industries, critique um, where, the, uh, where the results or where the, the introduction of the ISM code has been questioned. Um, some of those critiques that are brought up and some of the studies are listed here on, on this slide. Um, I think uh, most of the critique that's listed here simply has something to do with the implementation. And according to my opinion, it has something to do also with the different organizational cultures that we have in the shipping business. That's why I had uh, in my initial part of, the, of this presentation shown the three different types of organizational culture. And I guess it is clear that if a ship owner wasn't very convinced um, operating under the uh, impression of, of compliance culture, that on a voluntary basis an SMS is a good thing to do, he may not necessarily see the benefits now that it is mandatory. So and I think it is that cultural change that still is, is, um, is a big challenge uh, for the efficiency and, of course, for the success of these ISM systems. Um, there are, of course, um, also some industry stakeholders that are uh, frustrated as a result of, um, of um, the not always optimal implementation on, on a shipping company level. Some industry stakeholders, like for instance the big oil majors, have, um, um, that's, have come forward with own individual standards. Um, the, um, oil majors basically um, operating in, in Occam, an organization where they just try to, to, to bundle their interest has come up with something uh, different. That's the tanker management and self-assessment um, consisting of four levels and uh, they consider level one, uh, the ISM compliance and then ask shipping companies who want to carry their products to, um, to improve on, on further three levels. What they also do is, I mean, they follow the structure of the ISM code, but basically they add key performance indicators and best practice guidance, and that's something that is uh, not available in the, I in the ISM uh, system in, in the IMO. But that's there simply because ship owners should be encouraged, basically, to come up with their own systems. Well, as I said, um, the ISM code has changed the shipping industry tremendously. It has um, highlighted the focus on, on, on safety. 
But um, I think the main challenge for the system, also for the future, is basically to, in, to convince every ship owner uh, coming on board that uh, this is a worthwhile thing to do because in the end every effective safety management system um, needs the active support by management otherwise you would probably not see a lot of good um, um, systems coming out of that. If there are any questions I'm happy to answer them either in this session or at any other opportunity. Mm -hmm.